Listen to this podcast or I'll gut you. Welcome back, Horror Hounds, to Ghostman and Rivera's Horror Show Podcast. I'm Mike Ghostman Pickle. I'm James Rivera. We're going to have a more casual podcast than we usually do, but we are going to discuss two movies that we've been meaning to discuss. We're going to be discussing the sequels to Candyman. Candyman, Farewell to the Flesh, and Candyman, Day of the Dead, or as I like to call it, Candyman, the Mexican edition, part three. (laughs) And then we're going to close off with our horror to be roulette reviewing the films that we got assigned last week by our random um, to be roulette game. I'll be reviewing Snoop Dogg's Hood of Horror. What will you be reviewing, Michael? Mother's Day, the remake of the 1980 film starring uh, Rebecca De Mornay. Love the original Candyman. The original Candyman is one of my favorite horror movies. It's one of my favorite m- movies, period. Um, I actually rewatched the original one before delving into two and three because I like to ha- I wanted to have a clear idea of the original in my head it's still a masterpiece fucking great horror movie um still tony todd is one of the greatest villains in the history of the horror genre he has such a strong presence it's overwhelming that it's hard to put into words i love the effect that they do with his voice when you see him come out it seems like his voice comes from everywhere all at once whenever he's speaking to you it has the sound design has this cool thing of making it sound like his voice is all enveloping it doesn't come from any one particular direction almost and that's like something you don't that's something you don't hear in two or three either he, he uh, does yeah. not sound as menacing i i i've noticed that too in two and three you still got the great candy man voice because it's tony todd but you could tell that they didn't have the, it's not the same sound effect that makes his voice sound like it's coming from everywhere at once. And if I had to venture to guess why, it's because they probably forgot how to do, how to mix his voice in the original one or didn't leave any formula on how to get it done. Only reason I know that this is a problem is um, watching, um, I'm a big fan of Batman. So the old 90s cartoon Batman, the animated series, the first appearance of Mr. Freeze had a really cool effect with his voice that made it sound icy and cold and almost inhuman, like this effect that they put it through. But you could still hear the original actor's voice perfectly. When they brought Mr. Freeze back for another episode, it didn't sound like it, and it was because the creator said they didn't write down what they did and they could not get the exact sound formula right to get the original Uh sound. So I imagine they probably encountered the same problem with Candyman 2 and 3. So what happened with the outfit? Why did the outfit become... All of a sudden, he's, he looks like this, just this debonair man walking into the room. <laughs> I think it's because part two and three, he, he, he's wearing something different in both of the sequels. To be clear, in each movie, it's slightly altered. The first one has a very specific costume that it looks very... It looks like some, uh, something somebody sophisticated would wear, some, especially back, uh, back hundreds of years ago. It has a certain type of style and uh, elegance to it but there's something about it that feels very old world. The sequel, which we'll get into first, uh, Candyman, um, Farewell to the Flesh, it looks like the same costume, but modernized and made a little bit too sleek, where it takes some of the old world menacing feel, where the original one, definitely a very cool looking outfit, but there's something about it that felt really old or something not of this time that made him seem more off kilter. The fact that it's the same thing, but a little bit more modernized makes it closer to a Halloween costume of the original Candyman outfit. Well, if, if the Candyman that's in part two and three showed up in my room, I said, Hey, what's up, dude? <laughs> what's going on? I wouldn't run for the hills like the first one. Shit. <laughs> and then the third one, it's a completely different look. Mm. Yeah. Well, it's a completely different and- look. Before we dive into these two, I must say, after watching two and three, because I, I told you before, I've seen two before, but I didn't remember any of it, and I, ne- I never bothered to watch three. And holy hell, after watching these two, how badly do we need that Jordan Peele Candyman? <laughs> I think very, very, very badly. Please think- save this franchise, for God's sake, man. Yep. 
<laughs> so as you can see, we're not crazy about uh, the Candyman sequels. I'm not crazy about the Candyman sequels, but um, there's things about them that are definitely interesting and make it worth a watch for horror fans. I'll, I'll put it that way. They're yeah, not I, mean, I would recommend to a casual person. If you're a casual person, I'm going to tell you, go watch Candyman. Forget the sequels. But if you're a horror fan, you should see these. Yeah, and... I mean, two and three are worth watching. I mean, you have to watch them if you're a horror fan. Uh, three is much more entertaining because it's so much worse for me. And, you know, uh, part two was was too mediocre for me to even be invested in it at all. And it didn't have enough bad things in it to make fun of it. So I just kind of just lost interest in it. But they're really bad in comparison. In comparison to the original was what makes them really bad. Yeah. They would not be so bad if you held if you didn't hold them up to the to the original. No, they wouldn't be nearly as bad, but they have their fans. So, so gonna... this one was uh, directed by Bill Condon, who uh, this one's just Candyman Farewell to the Flesh. Yes, Candyman Farewell to the Flesh is part two, directed by Bill Condon, and uh, shortly after this, he did Gods and Monsters, a really good movie about the last days of uh, Frankenstein director James Whale. Mm -hmm. and right after that, he followed it up with Kinsey, a really good uh, movie with a uh, drama with uh, Liam Neeson, and then Dream Girls. So it's safe to say that he went on to much better work and he improved vastly as a filmmaker after, after doing this one. Yeah. And uh, this one had two writers on it. One of them was Rand Ravitch, mm -hmm. who wrote uh, Astronaut's Wife with uh, Johnny Depp and Charlize Theron, which wasn't bad. Mm -hmm. And uh, Mark... Kruger, who was a TV writer and producer. Mm -hmm. And uh, it starred Tony Todd, of course, as Candyman. Kelly Rowan from The Gate was the main star of it. Uh, William O'Leary from Bull Durham and Hot Shots. And the great Bill Nunn from School Days, Do the Right Thing, Death by Temptation, especially New Jack, New Jack City. I loved him in New Jack City. But uh, with this cast and with the filmmakers, this should have been a great movie. But... Uh, Sadly, it wasn't. So here's the synopsis. Three years after the events of the first film, Candyman arrives in New Orleans and targets a young woman whose father he killed years earlier and her brother was wrongly accused of the murder. Now with this one, uh, just like with three, they, they became formulaic out of the box. Mm -hmm. Starts out with the, story, with the story of Candyman, saying, and of course they follow up the story with saying Candyman five times. And the most generic way you could begin a sequel, and that's exactly how three begins. Doesn't it, doesn't it remind you almost of Friday the 13th Part 2? Yeah, exactly. At the beginning, they tell the campfire story of Jason, and then they rehash that story in every sequel. Candyman yeah. should not be stooping to the front. And I love Friday the 13th, but Candyman was always something that was much more sophisticated than Friday yeah. the 13th, so there's no reason that a sequel should play like that. Exactly. So, so they followed the same formula as part three did as well. You say the Candyman legend. Someone says it five times and Candyman kills them. Then someone hears about the killing and wants to prove it and prove that it's not Candyman. So they say it five times. Oh, it happens the exact same way in both movies. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but this one, I, I was just much less entertained by it than I was three because it's just so dramatic, so serious. I mean, good acting and everything, good characters, but just nothing to care about. Uh, it has n no gravitas like the script or story in the first one to give it weight. Uh, more of the backstory is re revealed, but it's revealed in a dull present. And then uh, some great hook kills, and they become more and more impractical as the, the movies go along, <laughs> with this big blunt hook being shoved through people instead of, Cooking them, but oh, uh, <laughs> yeah. And uh, as I said before, Candyman didn't look or sound menacing. And uh, I'm I'm gonna be I'm gonna go out on a limb and say this. Um, and um, I don't know. This is just my interpretation, and I don't mean any kind of offense. But it seemed like um, not only does his voice not have the same effect, like they forgot how to mix it right, but for me, Tony Todd's presence took a long time to achieve in this movie what I felt instantly the first time he appeared in the original. The first time he appeared, I still get chills when I watch it. There's something 
about him when he's standing right there across the, uh, looking at Helen across the, the driveway. And then he starts speaking those beautiful romantic words, even forgetting the fact that they didn't mix it well. It seems like a less invested performance than the first one. And it took a while for me where by the end, I was convinced that Tony Todd was like the candy man. And by the end, I started to buy the performance as candy man. But it, for me, it took a while for me to get in like scared of this, of his iteration the second time around. It doesn't seem like it's as committed as a performance until it goes along further. And then you start to feel his performance get becomes more interested, but he seemed almost disinterested when this movie started well, off. Is that just me or is that an impression <laughs> that you got? Because his first Definitely. appearance didn't scare me at all, or didn't leave me with any kind of feeling the way that it did in the original. Well, number one, I think it's the dialogue. Okay. He did not have the great dialogue, and it gets worse in three, by the way. Holy shit! I didn't even, I couldn't even believe that shit was coming out of his mouth in part three. But in in here, it was in part two, it was just unimpressive and dull. In mm. three, it was just plain bad. But in this one, like you said, it was nothing menacing about it. Nothing menacing about him. And uh, <clears throat> on top of it, it being bad words, you know, bad script that he was having to deal with, mm -hmm. it was also not done very cinematically. Each time he appears, I mean, some of the appearances of Candyman in part three were more cinematic than in part two. Okay. It was just too, too overly dramatic, too overly serious, too concerned mm -hmm. with uh, the story and the melodrama. And it, I, I literally, this is one of those movies where I just stopped taking notes on it. And I literally, my mind would start to wander several times through the movie where I just didn't even care what was going on. So I don't even have that much notes on it and that much to say. <laughs> well, one thing that I, I, I should say about this is that um, it, it does, the one scene that I do like, that I really like, is mostly the, it comes towards the end when they recount the Candyman legend. And um, it's a good scene, but it's interesting because it approaches it from a completely different, and I've told you what I thought about this before, Michael, but I like that it, it, it approaches the same story from a completely different angle. In the original Candyman, we get to know Candyman's origin story where he was the son of a slave. He grew up amongst wealth and he was a sophisticated artist and painter and all the white people would commission him to like paint portraits of, um, of their daughters or their wives or whoever, somebody who can perfectly capture their beauty. He was a respected, very um, sophisticated man of culture. <laughs> now, when you hear the story recounted in the original Candyman, it's only somebody telling the story. It's a professor who studied a Candyman and wrote a paper just trying to tell, um, go through the story. And when he tells the story in the original one, you'll notice that there's like the, the it's a pretty good close up. It's a little creepy. There's some noise that's going on underneath the story that he's telling that's very subtle that you may not notice, but you hear very slight screams or like just hinting at the horror of what Candyman go through, went through when um, he impregnated a young white woman. Then the white mob came, they cut off his hook for a hand, um, slathered him in honey, and then let all the bees loose on him so they could devour him and they call him Candyman. In the original, the story is told, it has a very scary, creepy almost ghostly campfire effect to it because the fact that you don't see it happen, you just hear somebody tell it like an urban legend and tell it in a way that's very sinister with all that creepy music going on underneath it and all those creepy sound effects makes Candyman feel very mysterious, very otherworldly. And it puts a level of, I don't know, I wouldn't say Michael Myers because I can't compare it to that because he's not as much of a mystery as my, Michael Myers, but it does help to give him a certain kind of, mystique that makes his legend feel very powerful i think more like pinhead pinhead there you go pinhead actually that's that, that that's a better way to put it and i really love the way that they do it you don't see it happening in the original now the sequel takes a completely different tack at the end of it where they actually visualize what happened to Candyman. you get to see what happened to it and I think there's a trade-off where yeah. I don't think the candy man is nearly as scary by the end of it because you kind of demystified some of the mystery and you could see that as a criticism or not, depending on how you look at it. But I think there's a good trade-off uh, that comes with it when you get to actually see what happened and you get to see it, like um, get, get to see the story unfold. I think you have a lot more sympathy for um, Tony Todd's character for the candy man 
when you see the story unfold, you see how it was very racist. You see the pain that he went through. You saw the misery that he went through. And he becomes sort of a sympathetic figure where he feels like he is everything, all the evil, all the hatred that was projected onto him kind of fed into his soul. And he became this entity that sort of reflected that hatred back that he received the the racial resentment, the, the angry mob, the evil that they did to him. And you get the feeling that what they did to him was really wicked and evil and wrong. And even the way that the people are laughing at him while he's in pain and slathering his body with, um, with all the honey and letting, calling in that lady who says, we're going to call him, he's the candy man, sweet to the sweets kind of explains that, that story. So on the one hand, I like it's, it, it, it kind of undercuts the legend a little bit because it demystifies it. But on the other hand, it makes you understand Candyman as a character a lot more, a lot more, and you get to see kind of how his evil is just a reflection of society. And I think that's a really interesting angle, and I think that's good for a sequel to try to approach the same material from a different, from a different angle because you can't repeat what's in the first one. However, if they were going to do that, I wish the movie were more concentrated on this aspect than it the, the than it is in telling a typical you know, just a, almost just like a typical slasher sequel for yeah. such a special, unique story that I think if they would have focused on that, that aspect, you could have had a different sequel that was very good, but approached the story in a different manner. So I actually like the, the changes that they make by, by visualizing it, but the movie itself that comes before that is kind of, um, it doesn't hold up. I think there's some effective kill scenes in it here and there, but everything about it feels like a weak rehash of what we were seeing in the original Candyman. And then it even kind of takes on elements of any repetitive slasher sequel that you would see. And I think that's where it falters. I think that they were right in trying to create more sympathy for the monster. They were wrong in doing that and then building the most generic movie they could come up with around it. Yeah, and, and if they were just going to have such a generic approach to it, why not just go full cheese like part three? Just go full generic, and then it's much more enjoyable. It's it's not enjoyable at all to see something overly serious that's just that's just generic and and not hitting the mark at all. And I guess another thing that this movie fails yeah. at is its location. Um, what's interesting about the Candyman, the original three films, is they all take place in a different part of the United States. The original one is Chicago, Cabrini Green, the worst, um, the worst project in America, or at least it was at the time. Cabrini Green is now all cleaned up now. It's been gentrified. Then in the second one, it's New Orleans, which is where um, a Candyman's origin actually comes from. In the third one, it's Southern California. So what you have is you have an interesting, you have some, you have this interesting idea where you could put the Candyman legend in different locales and new orleans is perfect new orleans has such a great history it has a very otherworldly look to it new orleans is already going to give you a lot of production value as as it is without having trying to spruce it up because it has such a visual personality and such a distinct look and i feel like they didn't take advantage of the location that they were in you have this magnificent city that you're in city with all kinds of beautiful culture and you don't really get to experience or appreciate it or understand it the way that in the original Cabrini Green may be an ugly place but you got a very a real feel for it you got a feel for it as a real place almost feels like New Orleans is almost incidental to the location of this yeah. film even though it's very important to the story because this is where it all begins so I feel like it's a failure to take advantage of an interesting location that is ripe for cinematic possibilities. Well, uh, Bernard Rose was asked to write a script for this and he wrote it. And, uh, uh, but the studio, the studio says that the script that Bernard Rose wrote for part two was rejected because it did not feature Candyman, but explored other urban horror myths. But Virginia Madsen from the original Candyman, she says that Bernard Rose wore, Rose wore a prequel where Candyman and Helen fall in love, and the studio did not want to do an uh, interracial love story. So uh, she had a major problem with part two. She said that making him a slave, that she did not like that they made him a slave, that uh, Bernard Rose wanted him to be more like an African, African-American Dracula, and they just snatched that away from him and made him like a tragic slave figure instead of this uh, upstanding poet type of guy, mm -hmm. you know? And then... Uh, <clears throat> 
I thought it was interesting that the poster was released and it had uh, a candy man attacking the main star in the front of it. And it was released right around the, the OJ Simpson trial was in full swing. So the poster with a, a black man stalking a white woman was seen as controversial. So it had to be taken down. Understandably. I mean, I find that really interesting that they weren't willing to tackle an interracial love story because for one, the original one already has an element of that. And that's already exactly. instrumental to the story of Candyman is the interracial love story. So that seems like a really cowardly cop out on the part of the studio to be afraid to, uh, I don't know, to tackle something like that. I would like to read what Bernard Rose's treatment was or what his script was, because I guarantee you whatever it was, it was probably a lot more interesting than what we see here. Um, that's an interesting point that I had never considered that by making it by just like it kind of like by emphasizing the aspect of him being the son of a slave and trying to like show it more. It does deem like I said earlier, it does demystify him somewhat as a monster, though it makes him a little bit more sympathetic. Yeah. Like I said, it's not it's a choice that I can understand if the movie is done in a particular way. But I don't think this movie justified the way that they tackled that story where I'm like that could be a good movie this isn't it though yeah and after all these years afterwards why 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 didn't we ever get that bernard rose movie i i, I guarantee you it was good dude yeah it was probably a lot more interesting and usually because the, the directors of the original whenever you ever you notice this is trend whenever a filmmaker starts a franchise especially a horror franchise they have a certain idea of it Whenever it becomes a success and the studio is ready to capitalize and turn it off into a franchise, they always um, reject the original creator's ideas. And originally, like Friday the 13th, and we discussed this when we had Adam Marcus, the director of Jason Goes to Hell on the show, and he was talking about how um, Sean S. Cunningham makes Friday the 13th. The studio starts talking about Friday the 13th part two. And then he starts giving the ideas of like, make it an anthology series. And then they're like, oh no, we're okay with that. What about that kid, Jason, at the end of the lake? That's what we're going to make the movie out of. Same yeah. thing with, um, uh, with Wes Craven and A Nightmare on Elm Street. Completely, like, like not just completely let him start something original and then make a sequel that more or less, um, and I like A Nightmare on Elm Street too. It has its own, um, it has its own benefits and there's something very interesting about it, but that's for another episode. But it basically breaks all the rules of the original one. So it seems so typical of a studio to fall in love with the filmmaker's creation, get their input on what a sequel should be, and then completely reject it because they realize that it's not the boilerplate um, formula that they were expecting. If you notice, most creators, when they want to do sequels to it, they're rarely the typical slasher sequels that the studio ends up producing out of it. So I noticed that this is a trend in horror movies is that great horror filmmaker well i don't know if sean s cunningham is a great horror filmmaker but a <laughs> horror filmmaker makes a movie studios love it but then they decide that their ideas are not good for a sequel because they just want to rehash what the original what the person did in the original one and just do it over and over until you can't make money anymore so well, bernard just... wrote the sequel or prequel probably would have been something that would have added to the story would have expanded the mythology and would have not felt just like Candyman 2. He's back to hack you up. Yeah. Just like with any failed franchise, it's just a flurry of bad decisions, rights floating from company to company, and people just don't know what to do with it. And then they, they like you said, they, they take this movie that they love and they just completely bastardize it and misunderstand what was great about it and don't go with the original filmmaker. So it's it's a common trend amongst horror if you like look at almost every franchise almost every creator of the original one loses control and typically the creator usually despises what the studio ends up doing with that series yeah so i see candy man following that trend very unfortunate very yeah unfortunate. and uh and just as with other failed sequels too the decisions seem to get worse <laughs> as the sequels go along and that's definitely the case with part three. But I must say, I was thoroughly entertained by part three. I laughed harder at part three than most comedies do. You did? And even even typing up my notes today, I was laughing all over again. 
and I'm, it's going to be hard for me to get through this discussion without cracking up. <laughs> Candyman. So the, the first Candyman came out in 92. Candyman, uh, Farewell to the Flesh is 95. And now we are at the end of the 20th century in 1999 with Candyman, Day of the Dead, or Candyman, Dia de los Muertos, the Mexican edition, as I would like to call this one. Yeah. We have moved <laughs> away from Chicago, Cabrini Green, and we've moved away from New Orleans, coming to Southern California, our area, yay, Boyle Heights, which is very close to us, by the way, that's where this takes place, Boyle Heights. Mexican neighborhood, hardcore Latino area. So uh, give the synopsis. We'll get into the Boyle Heights aspect of this uh, in, in a minute. Okay. Uh, Candyman Day of the Dead was directed and co-written by Turi Meyer, who wrote Leprechaun 2 and Wrong Turn 2 and directed a lot of TV, like uh, he directed a few episodes of Buffy, Angel, Smallville, uh, Vampire Diaries. And it was written by Alfredo Septian, who also uh, co-wrote Wrong Turn 2 and Smallville and Vampire Diaries. So it's these two producers who work together a lot. Mm -hmm. And then they were contracted by Artisan, who was just getting started up. They hadn't had their big uh, hit with the Blair Witch Project later in the year. So they were looking to find Anything. something to sink their teeth into, you know? And naturally, a pre-existing franchise is a, a guaranteed moneymaker. So that's yeah. moved from a business point. So, of course, they brought back Tony Todd, and uh, they brought back the star in this one. <laughs> Jeez, dude. It's going to be hard to get through this. So. Donna D'Arico from Baywatch Nights. <laughs> the, by far the funniest part of the movie. Uh, Sue Garcia, Rod from uh, Nightmare on Elm Street, surprisingly good in this. Mm -hmm. And also surprisingly good in this is Wade Williams, who was Buford Tuttle in Three from Hell. He was awesome. Great character actor. Yeah. So in this one, 25 years after part two, Candyman arrives in East Los Angeles to convince an artist de a descendant of his to join him by framing her for a series of grisly murders of her friends and associates. Tony Todd has said that he does not like this movie, and I see why. What I find interesting about this is that um, Candyman has more um, race elements than a lot of horror stories do. And you see it in the first one, especially with Cabrini Green. Um, the area, the second one, where they tackle the kind of racism that created the Candyman. Interestingly enough, this a lot of this has to do with uh, racism against Mexicans, against Latinos, against people like me. Um, I have to give this movie credit, especially in 1999. Especially now, we don't really have that much um, representation of Mexican-Americans on screen. I think there's a lot of great Mexican movies or a lot of great horror movies from Mexico or movies from Mexico, but we don't have nearly as much in the United States. It certainly hasn't flourished. And I'm not saying that black cinema has flourished. That still has a long way to go. But um, Mexican presences on screen are almost non-existent in Hollywood. So I kind of mm. found it kind of amusing and interesting, and I appreciate that they use... Mexican culture and they try to they try their best to do with it however it's very apparent that this is a movie written by well-intentioned well-meaning white people who don't really understand Mexican culture but I give them a pass because you could tell that they're really trying and they're really trying to illustrate a point of about the, the type of um I guess the type of prejudice that Mexican Americans face in this country, the, uh, the type of racial slurs they have to endure and the struggles that are more specific to Mexican racism, as opposed to racism against black people. So I appreciate that they really do try to tackle that in here and they even get some good Mexican actors, but Holy shit, it comes across as somebody trying a white person trying really hard to nail Mexican culture and not quite getting there. But I do see the effort. But some of the, some of the cliches and the way that they're portrayed are funny. They, the, the way they act, the way that they exaggerate. And I'm not going to repeat it because I'm not trying to perpetuate it. But sometimes the way they act and, I don't know, interesting stereotypes that are meant to be endearing, though I'm not sure they're quite as endearing as they're meant to be. But why try to dabble in Mexican culture like this and put the center of the whole story, the most white bread, cliche, blonde, white girl? 
at the I center don't know. <laughs> That's another thing that hints you, that kind of clues you in that this is a story trying to tackle racism and it's trying really hard to do it from a progressive manner, but it is still written by white people. And there you have it right there. You're going to make an entire movie centered around Mexican culture and how Candyman, how the legend of Candyman might affect the community of Boyle Heights. And then you make the main character a blonde white girl from Baywatch that is just as Hollywood as a yes. kid. And you could tell that they probably weren't aware that by doing that was doing that was a clueless decision. Yeah. And uh, uh, I wrote this sentence, the one sentence to describe the opening of the movie and it sets the tone and tells you exactly what to expect from this movie. Artificial looking blonde with fake boobs wakes up awkwardly in her panties and a tank top in a white dream room. <laughs> That's how you pictured it? Okay, you know, in, in all fairness, that opening sequence is more cinematic than anything that happens in Candyman 2. It's at least visually interesting. There's some imaginative choices as far as the direction goes and the editing, but there's almost something funny about making her, waking her up like that. And that's another problem I have with, 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 with I guess, the sequels to this as a franchise. <laughs> It almost seems like as cool as that opening is by Hatton, there's nothing wrong with obviously people showing off their bodies on screen, but by having her wake up like that, making her bimbo-ish and having her like scantily clad from the first part of the movie, <laughs> it just um, puts this in the area of like cheesy slasher movie territory when it just seems less serious. Just those decisions by themselves already make this uh, make it seem less serious. And can I say something? You blew my mind. I didn't know that Sue Garcia, I just, it clicked with me that that was Rod from Nightmare on Elm Street. And when you said that, I was like, it is. And I was like, oh yeah, it is. That's exactly There's, the same person. Th Duh. Think, think, back to, think back to that scene when he was first accused of the murder. Yeah. He was, he was Rod in that scene. I was like, he's, that's Rod right there. He's like, it's almost the exact same scene. <laughs> I think he does a fairly good job in this movie with what he's given, though. I think if okay, it, after he, after that, he does excellent. He's ten times better actor in this than he was in Matt on Elm Street. Ten times. Yeah, isn't that ironic though? I mean, he's ten times better in this, but it's but the Nightmare on Elm Street, the one he's worth, that's still the better movie. Yeah, it, he's he's one of the most believable actors in this. He's one of the ones you care about the most. You care about him a lot more than you do the blonde. I can tell you that much. <laughs> it's weird. He seems like a more fleshed out, sympathetic character, even though we spend a lot less screen time with him. And you could tell that the writers are more interested in him than they are in her because he's given more traits, more sympathetic traits. His backstory is more drawn out. Yeah. Um, and you get a closer look of his, up to, uh, his, his personal life, where I feel like with the main character, with uh, um, Carolyn, you get to see what she does and you explore her family history, but you already know that she's related to the Candyman, and it kind of like reveals this up front. She does not have like the same fleshed out character that um, David has at, and, all. at all. And he has a lot less screen time, but you get to understand, you get to meet his family. You get to understand what he's been through. You see his struggles, you see where he lives. You get to see what a good person he actually is, what a decent human being he is. And you see the struggles that he has to live, live with on a day on, on a day to day basis. Now, it seems to me that the script is more interested in him, but it's still focusing on the unfleshed out fake white girl. Do you think this is the product of Hollywood forcing that to, forcing that in, or a studio system forcing it to be that way? Because the script doesn't seem as interested in her as it does in him, but yet she's the star, and yet she has more screen time. I, it's, it's such a beautiful mess that I don't, I, I can't tell where it went wrong. There's so many places that it goes wrong. I can't even tell. <laughs> and that the, the main character, that's the main uh, reason why this movie goes wrong is that main character. And I mean, I, I hate to bash on this poor woman. She's such a terrible actress. Like my goodness. And if you notice Actors that are as bad as her, they can be on screen silent, and it's bad. Mm -hmm. Just the way she was laying on the bed at the beginning, she was laying awkwardly and kind of off to the side. She didn't even know how to lay down. 
<laughs> so, so if if you see a bad actor, you can tell just from from their presence on screen that they just can't act, and it was just so distracting through the whole thing, but hilarious. <laughs> yeah, it was a very mannered, awkward performance to lead a film like this, and um, there's potential for something good here if you reworked it. But tell me that that entire ending needs to be completely lopped off in order for any oh. of this to work. The ending of this like, the last 10, 15 minutes of this movie derails this from this from like a so bad it's good kind of experience with a handful of actually really good cinematic kill sequences or some of the kill sequences that I like. It devolves into like bad writing, awful formula, con like contrived plot devices, the, the corrupt cop who suddenly claims that he's Candyman by the end and they pin it all on him. There's nothing believable there. There's nothing to build up to like, like the, the cop that they try to villainize and they pin all of the, all of the Candyman murders on at the end to try to destroy the legend and spoiler alert, sorry. But um, I think it's important to discuss that cop character because he's a lot a huge reason why the script of this is just, is terrible and why it just does not work and it's very clunky is because the manner in which he's forced into this movie he's a corrupt cop a racist cop racist. and that's fine that's realistic and um especially in an area like boyle heights the way that he speaks to both black people and the way that he seeks to, speaks to mexicans i think that's kind of realistic and it's very true and i think that he could serve a very particular purpose in this movie if you're using uh, an example of how the system doesn't want to work with people when people of color are being murdered, when Mexicans and, and black people are being murder murdered, how callous the police force can kind of be towards situations like that. But he's used to pin everything on. And then at the last 15 minutes, he suddenly is unhinged and he's yeah. the candy man now, and he's going to walk around with the hook and he's going to act like the candy man. There's nothing to lead up that it's believable that we believe he's shitty and that he's racist. Yes. I don't believe that he's actually psychotic and I don't believe that he actually had a psychotic break and started to buy into himself as candy man. That seems to become totally out of left field. It's it goofy, <clears throat> loppy. It doesn't need to be there. I don't even remember the end and I just saw this a couple days ago, but it seemed to me that it had like two or three endings and I just, my brain was so swirling from the fucking nonsense that I was digesting that I forgot what it all was. But yeah, everyone, that, isn't there like three different endings that all contradict each other and just pile up in a stupid way. Like the yeah, way that this movie climaxes is, fuck, is awful. Those goth they, kids. Oh, be, before I watched it, you told me that, that the ending was bad. So I was waiting for the bad ending, and then when those goth kids came, I was like, oh, this is the bad ending he's talking about. Oh, yeah, that's awful. And then it goes through something more awful after that. <laughs> like, my God, dude. I with the savage with it. Like, it <laughs> the movie, the story seems to close itself out in a very awful fashion, and it's when they shove those weird goth kids who worship the Candyman and want to call him forth. By the way, those are the, some of the fakest ass goths i've ever seen yes not believable as goth kids there's nothing there that to indicate that that they're that menacing or they're that powerful it just seems like they were shoved into the script you saw one of the characters at the beginning where they kind of lay an egg that that person is going to come back but it's not done in a way that's very good like they do plant the seeds for those characters to come but it's planted in a sloppy contrived way it just seems like writing in these awful characters as an excuse to get to the story to this point. And man, when they're trying to like, so dweeby, the way that they're trying to call on the candy yeah. man and the way that they behave and the way that they trap her, that whole scene is fucking dreadful, dude. It's bad. And the, the, the voices that they use, the really fake sinister voices. Oh, it's so cringe. Like it's like CW producing from beginning to end. It's like CW villain. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, exactly. on a CW show. That's a lot yeah. of this actually has CW show qualities, like to oh, yeah. how melodramatic it is. Some well, of the it was acting. It was made by CW filmmakers. That's what they did. They were producers and writers who who cranked out a bunch of crappy melodramatic teen shows. And it shows here, and it's it it starts out bad and cliche, and it just gets worse from there. Like like when I said that when the blonde wakes up awkwardly in bed, really awkwardly. And then it has the title sequence, with a decent title sequence. That's one of the only good parts about it with the yeah. close-up of the hook. But then after the title sequence, you got another close-up of the same blonde's face again. And she tells the story in the lamest voiceover I've ever heard. 
And then we see, we see that she's telling her story to her black friend, right? And then the first thing her black friend does is says five, a candy man five times in the mirror. Like the same exact thing that happens in two. Like, my God. And that, ra that racist cop, he's like, he's like in front of the girl, he says really racist things to uh, a black cop. Really racist next thing, to her Mexican friends. And the next thing, he, he, she, she says really racist things to her Mexican friends. A minute later, he turns around and starts being nice, super nice to her. And it, it, I don't, I didn't get why. I didn't get the, I didn't get the fact that he was flirting with her at all. I just didn't know why he was all of a sudden being nice. And you don't know he's flirting with her until you see him drop the flowers out of the, out of the car. The cheesiest bullshit, dude. No, it's not good flirting. And I think it's so, even the, the, the flowers doesn't indicate it because it's so awkward because it doesn't seem like it was flirting. It's like he dropped flowers there that they have to write an exposition scene where his partner says, oh, you're flirting with them again. Are you fucking yeah, just yeah. the audience? Because it's not very clear. You need to put it in a character's mouth to demonstrate to the audience in case you weren't aware that that shitty ass form of flirting was flirting. Here's to let you know. Yeah. So, so let me get into the aspects where it was just purely bad filmmaking that like was made by amateur. Okay. It starts with, you know, after the whole Miguel scene with the owner of the, the uh, gallery, right? Where this artificial looking blonde is some artist, right? Who has a show in this gallery. I did not believe she's an artist for a second, by the way. She doesn't, so, seem like, she doesn't possess the type of personality who's of somebody who's plugged into the art world. And we know people like that. Like, that does not seem like her. Yeah. So you have, the, you have her coming back to search uh, Miguel's place, right? Mm -hmm. While she's searching Miguel's place, you have a flashback to the very same place. So you see her walking through the place on a flashback of Miguel with some girl, with the, with the girl that he took home from the gallery. Mm -hmm. And then cut back to the blonde searching and then cut back and then you see that he's uh, being killed by Candyman. Mm -hmm. So amateurish lame. But that's not even worse than the bad filmmaking. You remember the scene where the blonde changes clothes from one scene to the next? She's literally in one room. They show her in another room that looks like the same time of day, same scene and everything, but she's in different clothes. That's the only way you know that it's a different day. Mm -hmm. so, with those, so there's no indication it's the next day. You got, I think it was three scenes I counted where the characters were facing the wrong way in the dialogue scenes where he put their eye, the director put their eye line in the wrong place and the characters didn't even appear to be looking each, at each other. And then you got the <laughs> shot, <laughs> you got the shot of the blonde in the bathroom, right? And then her mom is supposed to be there and they show a close up of the feet. Every indication tells you that that's the blonde's feet and you don't know why she's barefoot because she just came in from outside. And, and Adina, my wife and I were both watching and she said, why does she have her shoes off? And then it shows the ghost mom. I said, no, that was the mom. I, said, I did not know that. It doesn't indicate that at all. But I will say uh, those three really cool things about this. Uh, the, the title sequence was pretty cool, but not, not awesome. So three pretty cool things I thought was when Candyman appears out of the train tunnel. Mm -hmm. I mean, it was nonsensical that this bimbo was walking around in the in a at night in the subway tunnels in east l.a no way mm -hmm. so uh uh candy man appears out of the train tunnel that was pretty cool and then you got the great death of not not the main racist cop but the other one. Oh when, yeah uh, that scene was great the, yeah the the, the blood person. bursts out onto the windshield and you see the hook come through the seat awesome kill and then uh rod i, I call him rod rod from the street but uh, him and his yeah. abuela were the best parts of the film for me. Yeah. You know, this is going to sound interesting with the abuela where they, they, they tackle how a lot of um, Mexican culture, a lot of it involves like magic. And of course, that we don't all, none of my family actually practices that, but it is a, but it is a part of it. For an audience that might be more interested in something that tackles that specifically in Boyle Heights, it's not horror related, but there was a show on stars called Vida. It takes place in Boyle Heights. It 
attempts to do a lot of the same things with uh, what Candyman 3 does with Mexican culture, except it actually nails it and gets it right. Yeah. And um, it even tackles the way that the abuela is with like um, how the, how she's predicting the future and the different um, forms of black, uh, the different forms of magic that she practices. So if you want to see a more accurate version of that in the same city, check out Vida. That's not horror. That's definitely yeah. not horror, but it's go, it nails the culture in a way that this movie completely fails to do. But I, I believe that that was his abuela. Yeah. Uh, I, I believe that she was some kind of spiritual healer that, that had some type of power. I, I believed everything between those two characters. I believe everything they did. Yeah. So everything, um, yeah, everything revolving those two actually was really good. I, and like I said, the movie, uh, whenever we'll call him Rod, whenever the movie <laughs> abandons Rod, it becomes infinitely less interesting. And it might've been better just to make the story revolve around him. Yeah. Especially since you're going to make this about Boyle Heights and Mexican culture, might as well have the audience's avatar actually be somebody who is a part of that culture, not the one yeah. white girl walking around. In a Hello. Oh, and by the way, the abuela was the actress who played uh, the woman who killed Selena in, uh, in, in Selena with Jennifer Lopez. So every time I see that poor actress, she's so good. But every time I see her face, I think that's the, the woman that killed Selena. <laughs> So you you already have kind of uh, what's her name? Let me see really quick. Lupe, Lupe Anteveros. Yeah, I, I should have got her name. Sorry about that, Lupe. But yeah. she's awesome. Oh yeah, she she's awesome in this. But um, yeah, these are just for me. They're kind of dismal sequels. They don't work. They're not very good. Um, part three definitely has some kind of entertainment value to it. I can't say that it doesn't. But I don't feel that um, it's worthy of the original film. I don't think either of them are really worthy of the original film. The original film is in a class by itself as far as horror movies go. It's very eerie. It's creepy. It has one of the best scores ever. And what's interesting, the sequels use the original, a lot of uh, Philip Glass's original music in Candyman, which is this really beautiful gothic score that heightens everything that you're seeing around and makes everything kind of feel mythical. Doesn't it seem like, I don't know. It's just like maybe because the decline in quality, that music doesn't even help to spruce anything up or make anything better. We're in the original one. That's such an important part of what makes the movie work so well as Philip Glass's score. I feel like Philip Glass's music kind of gets drowned out in the idiocy of everything that's going on in the sequel. I wasn't even aware that there was a score in two or three. <laughs> I must say, I mean, this part three is going to be one of those films that I show people because it's, I highly re recommend watching part three with a group of people. And so I guarantee you will laugh your asses off, dude. This is a comedy through and through. And I, I made, I made a, you know, a list of the bad filmmaking, a list of the bad things about it. I made a list of the good things. But the biggest list by far is the funny shit in this, the comedy. Dude, first of all, that blonde screaming. When she starts screaming, I could not stop laughing. I, I, I'm about to burst out laughing right now just thinking about it. The, one of the worst cinematic screams I have ever heard. Just wow. And then you cut to the, the part where it cuts to her rocking back and forth in the shower. I had to pause it. It was so hilarious. Mm -hmm. Something about in the scheme and the editing of what's going on, and it shows her rocking back and forth in the shower. One of the funniest things I've ever, ever seen in a horror film. Then you got uh, the Candyman kills her friend and rips her stomach open. Do you see the funny face that her friend makes? She makes the funniest face. She looks like Harpo Marx when you go. That one, I, I, had, to, I had to stop that one and rewind it. It was so funny. And then you got the... Uh, the female cop that's just thrown in there and, and she's barely there for any reason whatsoever. But the female cop actually looks, they're talking about the, the girl being crazy and thinking that she's running around killing people. She says, she gives a whole meaning to PMS. Like, my God, that's so, such bad taste. Okay, really quick, that actress who was making that funny face was Alexia Robinson. I wanted to bring something up about that character that I forgot to, to, to do. Isn't that like, 
I don't know, the way that she's used, it seems like they're repeating the same thing with Casey Lemon's character in the original Candyman, but they make her seem more incidental and more token to the rest of the story. They just need to shove in the black best friend for the sake of having it. And she um, she feels like the epitome of a token character. She doesn't really have any personality. The only reason that she's there is to comfort the main character and tell her that everything's okay or ask her if she's okay or let her know that her her dreams aren't real. But like she doesn't exist in the movie in any outside of their re- relation. She doesn't even feel like a real person, to be quite honest, the way that yeah. she's written. She's only written to be there to be... I guess, I don't even, I wouldn't even say a sidekick because I mean, what, she's like her roommate and she seems like she's, it's suggested in the movie that there's good, that they're really good friends, but it's not demonstrated or illustrated in any kind of meaningful way. And when she gets killed, it's almost like a parody of the original Mm -hmm. film where Casey Lemons gets killed. But when Casey Lemons got killed, you cared and you felt bad and it was actually pretty horrifying. And when she's at the door and Helen's screaming her, don't come in, please don't come in. You're like hoping she doesn't come in the door and that you're yeah. like, I'm scared. Her just seems like she was there just to tell her a few things and then to have a cool candy man scene, a cool kill scene. So stupid. And there it is. You have it right behind you. There it is, Michael. Yeah. <laughs> For those of you who um, are watching that is what I'm talking about. He just kills her and it just like that character has no reason to even be in this movie is my point. Well, as, as useless as she was, I did like her. I liked her better than the main character. She was a better actress. Yeah. And when I saw that first scene and they had a conversation, the very first thing I thought, God, I wish they would have switched these actresses in the roles. That black girl should have been the main character and the white girl should have been the lame friend that would, who made the stupid faces when she's killed. So that how, how, did that dir- how did that director not notice how bad that face was she was making? That was horrendous, dude. The second time the racist cop comes up and, and is racist to the black cop and he fucking pops him and beats the shit out of him. Funny as hell. After Candyman, Wipes out all the goths. Mm-hmm. When she throws her hands in the air and walks out freaking out screaming, funniest part of the movie, dude. That's another one I had to pause because I was laughing so hard. And then finally, the the last comedic part came from Candyman himself. He, This director, these writers, made him say, be my victim so much that I swear I heard in my head, the last time he said, be my victim, he said, be my victim, I heard, but I'm boom, psh. Tony Todd is pretty committed in this movie and I actually think his performance seems a little bit more intense than in the second one, but it hardly matters because they just shove the same things in his mouth over and over that it becomes comical where be my victim is supposed to be something menacing. It's like kind of like the Candyman catchphrase when he repeats it over and over, it starts to have a comical effect on it by, by the end of it completely demystified and he's not scary at all. He's not scary at all in this movie, but it's not because of Tony Todd's performance. It's just that no great performance would be able to sell the movie that that's tra- that it's trapped in. The fact is, it is trapped in a film that is inherently silly, that is really bad writing, poor filmmaking choices, that Tony Todd can act his ass off until the end mm. of time. It cannot save this movie from itself. And that's you- too bad because he's actually really good in this one. Yeah, and, and you know it's bad that, that if... By the end of the movie, I was cringing every time Tony Todd opened his mouth because I was embarrassed by some of the things he said. Like, no self-respecting writer is going to let that go through the screen. No way. It's such bad monologues. So bad, dude. I think what the second one attempts to do is admirable. Except if it was going to go down the route of what it was doing, it should have felt like less of a boilerplate slasher sequel. I think the second one could have been an excellent addition to the Candyman mythology if they chose yeah. just to stick with the sympathetic track and his backstory and stuff uh, in, in that aspect of the story. You could have had something with it. The third one, I'm not really sure what you could do to improve it. I mean, I guess you could you could have switched some of the actors out, but I mean... That story needed to be, there's not there's not even a problem with pl- placing it in Boyle Heights. Like I said, I kind of really do appreciate, despite my complaints and me making fun of it, I do appreciate 
them attempting to try to make a film that revolves a horror film that revolves primarily around Mexican culture. I really do appreciate it. And but it had real Mexican characters in it. Real like Mexican characters real. and real <laughs> Mexican actors in it. So I, I do appreciate that. And I could tell that there was an honest, good faith attempt to try to do right by it. But I feel like that's not the problem. You just need to have maybe actual Mexican writers do it if you want if you want a more accurate view of that culture, if you want a better snapshot of that culture. Why don't you ask people who are actually in plugged into the culture to to write for you? That's just my take on it. I do think it's admirable what they did and what they were attempting to do. It just doesn't quite work out. But I do think there's potential for a good Candyman movie in Boyle Heights. Yeah. Even more so in New Orleans. Cut the filmmakers some slack. We don't know to what extent the studios meddled in these films. And as you can tell, the studio prevented probably what would have been a better Candyman sequel with the original concept. But alas, they were not interested in doing anything on uh, involving interracial romance. And they, it, it was a, a group of filmmakers who churned out a lot of cheap TV and instead of cinematic filmmakers as well. So, and, and we mentioned how bad the climax was, but what made it even worse was that, that the, the, this blonde just nonsensically picks up this really cheap hook for no apparent reason and is just walking through this really poorly designed lair. I think they're trying to do the same thing with Helen at the end of the original Candyman where she becomes her own urban legend after her her husband says Helen five times in the mirror and she comes with her hook. Yeah, and she she tears through the the painting with the hook and that's supposed to kill Candyman. (sighs) Here's another thing. Whatever happened with Helen turning into an urban legend at the end of Candyman, that was never followed up on. I want to know no. what happens with that. I, I do think that that's an interesting thing, and I get that's more, it was meant more to, I I don't think it was meant to, like, spin the franchise in a certain direction. I think it's just meant to be more of a, a shocking ending for the for that specific film. I don't think the original Candyman, when they're making it, they're thinking, let's turn this into a franchise. They just came up with an ending where Helen becomes her own urban legend in the form of a Candyman-like character, where if you say her name five times, she appears and um really memorable closing sequence when she appears and she guts her husband who you kind of learn to resent through the movie because he's such an asshole to her but we never followed up on that even that would be more interesting or what if they're both urban legends now Candyman and helen yeah bernard rose's story sounded better that following up on that sounded like it would have been better and not this you know what else sounds better the new Jordan Peele. Um, yes. Uh, yes. Jordan Peele wrote and produced <clears throat> and Neil, Nia DaCosta, a uh, female director, is going to be directing it. I like the story. So yeah. I guess the new Candyman revolves around the same child from the original Candyman, the one that Helen rescued after um, she went to take his place. So it's that little boy grown up, drawn back to Cabrini Green, which is now... Um, which is now a white neighborhood. It has been, um, what's the word? It's been gentrified. And he doesn't know why he's drawn back there or what his connection to that place is. And he's going to be playing the Candyman in the movie too. He's listed as, as that, as well as Tony Todd. So the trailer for it looks great. Um, the premise seems to me a little bit more directly plugged into the original film. And from my understand, it's actually going to ignore the sequels. This, and we, we should have had it last year, but I'm really, I really think that with this one, and I'm, and I don't know for sure, but I really do believe it. I think we're finally going to get the Candyman sequel that we deserved. Yes, and that this franchise deserves. Yeah, I am really, really excited to see the story that Jordan Peele came up with, and I'm excited to see um, how Nia DaCosta, how she does directing this film. So I can't wait for that one. I know it's going to be 2022 now. Um, yeah. If it, the, I feel like if there's any team that could like um, resuscitate this franchise, it's those two. It's those. Well, two. it's 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 impossible for it not to be better than two and three. I'll tell you that much. <laughs> and I think what else is going to help help it um, is the fact that they are um, going to have. Actual, like black creators working on the Candyman story. I don't yeah. think none of, the ori- none of the original three Candyman movies were directed by a black filmmaker. 
um, and they were mostly done by white people. And I think it's probably it's kind of obvious when you watch them. Even the first one, which is wonderful, there are elements of it you could tell that a white person came up with it. But I think it'll be interesting um, to see that tackled from a more um, informed place. Now, I guarantee you, this one will have better acting too. Yeah, no doubt about it. No doubt about it. So, uh, part three. I, I ended up loving it at the end just because of the absurdity of it and it's pure comedy. But uh, the, by, by the ending, it just turns into a full shit fest. And then the, that blonde saves her worst voiceover for the last, for last. So okay. it's just bad from the beginning to end, but thoroughly entertaining if you want to laugh at a bad movie. <laughs> yeah. But the last 15 minutes are not so bad. It's good. The last 15 minutes are just straight bad. Yeah. <laughs> that's that's but it. it it had me laughing, so I, I can't bash it too much because I was thoroughly entertained and engaged through the entire, entire runtime. <laughs> so uh, we ended up talking about the third one for a long time. Yeah. Let's get into our um, closing segment for the day. We're going to do um, 2B TV Roulette, our follow-up. So um, w- one of our segments that we do here on The Horror Show is 2B TV Roulette. 2B TV is a free app that you can get it on Amazon. I believe you can get it on Roku and multiple other platforms. You can watch films for free and they have a huge selection. The only catch, and it is a minor catch, is that there's um, commercials in it. So it's kind of like watching television. However, the commercials are, for the most part, they're pretty well-timed and they're very brief. They're not like watching TV, like movies on television where it's like, 10 minute commercials and you lose interest in what you're watching before it comes back. It's very brief. So it's worth watching and they have a big horror section. So what Mike and I like to do, we like to close our eyes and randomly scroll through the horror section. Wherever we stop, we have to watch whatever movie we land on, be it good or bad. Um, our rule though is if it's a movie, we land on a movie we have, we've already seen before we can go again. And uh, another one of the drawbacks of 2 TV is Huge, enormous selection, probably more selection than I've seen from any other streaming service, but a lot, a lot of filler. But I will say this, since the beginning of Tubi, each time I go back and visit Tubi again, there's a little bit less filler each time. So they, they're adding more and more really decent titles on. And the, uh, uh, the one I chose was beyond decent. You didn't choose it. Well, yeah, you. it was randomly chosen for me by fate. <laughs> Okay, so um, I'll start off. Uh, the movie that I landed on uh, was Snoop Dogg's Hood of Horror, which actually was really glad to land on it because I enjoyed Bones, and Snoop Dogg is a very funny pop culture presence to me, so I always yeah. enjoy seeing him, whether it's serious or ironic. So this is sort of, I guess you would say, in the vein of Tales from the Hood, where you're try- attempting to do a sort of Tales from the Crypt anthology in an urban setting in a certain type of neighborhood, except this is a lot more playful than Tales from the Hood. And that's saying something, because I consider Tales from the Hood the original one. I think it's socially relevant, yes. I think it's loaded with subtext, and I think it's very meaningful, and I think that it has very serious themes, and it tackles very serious topics. But it's still a very fun film. It does it in a way that's exciting. It does it in a way that's scary in ways that make you laugh. There's a certain thrill that you get out of it because all of the message are conveyed through the storytelling. You never feel that you're being preached to. And I think it's the same thing in Snoop Dogg's Hood of Horror, except this takes itself even less seriously than um, Tales from the Hood, as you would expect for any film that's going to involve, any horror film that involves Snoop Dogg you got to expect some level of camp there, just having his presence. So Snoop Dogg is like the Crypt Keeper type character in this one where he tells three different stories. Um, and his story, he has his own story, which is the fourth story, which is a wraparound. Um, all of these stories are actually pretty entertaining. Even when they get dumb, they still kind of like keep you uh, engaged and they still keep you laughing. And one of the interesting things that I, I, I found about it is the way that they use animation uh, between, in these movies. This one, like Tales from the Crypt or Tales from the Hood, the stories are kind of morality tales. In this movie, when a character gets their comeuppance, kind of like how they get their comeuppance in Tales from the Hood, um, you don't see it done in a live action manner. It turns into a cartoon. So if you're waiting for the villain of a particular story to get to what's coming to them, 
or actually not all of these characters are villains. Some of them are good people who go too far in a bad direction. When you see them get their payback for their behavior in this movie, it comes in the form of an animation where Snoop Dogg appears as a sort of character who's there to guide you to your soul to wherever it needs to go, whether it's to heaven or to hell to escort you. So you never see them get their comeuppance in live action. It all comes down to animation and Snoop Dogg coming in as an animation, either escorting them to hell or sending them in the opposite direction, which would be uh, heaven. And Snoop Dogg's origin story as a character is told in animation. Snoop Dogg is a, um, a sort of crypt keeper that used to be a human being, be a gang member who is trying to repent uh, for, uh, for what he did because as a gang member he actually got his little sister killed in a gunfight so he spends his, his entire existence as this crypt keeper was uh, was done in order to bring his sister back and for him to repent for the, his sins for as long as he needs to until he's done so it has an interesting wraparound it's imaginative in it way in the way that it uses some of the um <clears throat> the animation and it actually has a really cool performance by Lin Shay. Did you know Lin Shay was in this? Oh, I didn't know that. No. Okay. So, um, my favorite story and it's of, of the stories in here and it's the last story revolves around a rapper who is very famous at some kinds of award show. Um, in, and in throughout this movie, Snoop Dogg, who is kind of like an entity, kind of like the Crypt Keeper, like I said, he moves in and out of some of the stories, particularly this one, as a regular person, in this case, a reporter. So you can see that this rapper is very full of themselves. They're coasting off of the fame that they have because they're, um, they were part of a hip hop duo and their partner was um, recently uh, was killed. So he's winning awards, getting kind of a sympathy vote and rising to the top. And the entire story is about all the bad things that he did, the way that he kind of sold his soul to try to rise to the top of the of the, of the hip hop game. And then Lin Shay plays this sort of character that just seems like, like it just seems like a you know like a little like an, an older woman that you would not think would be a threat in the world of hip hop. But she's basically like I don't know, kind of like the devil, I might say, or an angel. To be qu quite clear, it's never clear what Lin Shay is, but she's not human. But when she comes into the uh, <clears throat> when she comes into the story, she demonstrate everything that the rapper did wrong in his life, how he sold his partner out, how illegitimate he was, the way that he fucked over uh, folk, fucked over other people to become what he to become what he became. She becomes sort of I don't know like an executioner, a deliverer of justice in a certain in a, in a kind of way. And I think she did a really good job in this environment because it's primarily a black cast. The only other characters who are not black are a pair of redneck villains in the second story. And that story is not the best story, but it's probably the funniest one. But Lin Shay, uh, her performance is a real scene stiller in this movie. And she looks like she's having fun in a more relaxed horror environment where she's not meant to carry the story along, but she still gets to play a very cool, unique character, not just another person person in the game another uh, interesting story involves a pair of rednecks who have to move in with a group of black veterans who fought in vietnam they're forced to live with them to learn their honor and the games that they play on the on the games that these rednecks play on the people and the payback that they get and another one involves a graffiti artist who starts taking down gang members because she gains the ability to kill off other people by writing their name in graffiti on the wall and then they die some horrible awful death and that's another thing this movie is very gory the the gore nice. is fun it's so <clears throat> comical like you could tell that it's not meant to be serious but there's one particular scene where a character slips on a bottle uh slips on a beer bottle on a 40 and when he falls face forward onto the 40 the whole thing goes through <laughs> his entire face and goes up to the back of his head so when he falls down the 40 is sticking out of his skull and it's <laughs> beer along with the blood that <laughs> oh, yeah. um, playful gore in this movie like that you could tell that they went so over the top that i wouldn't say any of it's disturbing or offensive but you'll get a kick out of all of the little gore scenes it's not a perfect movie but mm. i'm not trying to say that it's like a great horror movie there are definitely some things where it's a little campy some of the acting here and there could be a little bit wobbly 
And it's not as solid of a film as something like Tales from the Hood. I, I can't say that it is, but it's kind of imbued with such a fun spirit, uh, like a, a genuine sense of fun hanging around the film that you could tell that everybody involved was having a good time coming up with these really outlandish stories that kind of function as morality tales, playing with the gore, playing with the concepts and playing with the idea that you don't get too many horror movies in an urban setting like this. So overall, um, warts and all, like I said, there's a lot of things that I could complain about, but it was hard for me to really bitch about much of anything because I was too busy having a good time watching it all unfold. And um, Snoop Dogg's Hood of Horror, it's available through Tubi TV. You just watch, watch it with commercials. Um, if you want to watch it without commercials, you could get this app called Brown Sugar. And it is all on um, black films and it's in their horror section if you want to watch it uncut. It already sounded good. And the more you tell me about it, it, it sounds awesome. I, I think you might have, over, have oversold it. <laughs> I hope I didn't older, oversell it because it's a one, it's a, it's a very minor little film. You could tell that, they don't, that the creators of this movie don't think that they're making some kind of serious horror movie or some kind of masterpiece but it's made with so much fun and it has so many cool little things. The Lin Shea appearance, the way that they use the hip hop music, the animations that are in it, the over the top gore, the um, just some of the silly premises of what's going on and some of the goofy acting, it all comes together to feel like a really good time. Has sort of like a little, like kind of a horror party vibe to it. That's the best way I could describe it. It's like a little horror party. You come, you see some over the top gore, you see some interesting morality tales. You get to yeah. see Big Dog handing it up as this Tales from the Crypt like figure um, delivering justice. And I just think it's just, it's pure entertainment. You were, you were talking about it, I'm like, how do you not like this movie? It's got fucking animation in it, it's got gory kills, it's got some campiness, and then the stories sound cool. It's got yeah. Lin Shea as a, as a devil type of character. Yeah, as some kind of entity kind of character. I think it's all just a good time, and I, I enjoyed it. I really enjoyed and, it. And that Lin Shea thing really surprised me. When I saw her name in the credits, I was like, oh, Lin Shea's in this, how weird. And then she's in the last story. She's one of she's part of the last story, so you kind of forget that she's in it while you're watching it. So when she comes in towards the end, you're like, "Hey, that's Lin Shea," and you think it's cool. Starts off what you think is a little cameo, and then you realize now she's like a very crucial, important character to the story, to that particular story. Nice. And Snoop Dogg presiding over it all. That nothing sounds bad about this. Yeah. I, now I now I feel really bad. I haven't seen it yet. <laughs> I'll say this: if the movie has does have flaws in it, and it does have flaws, it's flaws that are built into making this type of thing. If that makes uh, sense, it's the type of things that you would expect from a campy horror movie that doesn't take itself too seriously. I mean, that's what I want from a movie like this. I, I want some like campy flaws in it. Makes it more fun. Dude. I mean, I know I described it to you, but that beer bottle scene, when you see it, it'll make you laugh just so he just plunges head first onto it. And then you just see the, the beer just when, spurting out while the blood is spurting out on the sides. It's just funny stuff. When you were describing that, it was one of those times where, why has nobody done this yet? <laughs> yeah, you're surprised you've never seen anything like that. You know why? Because most <clears throat> horror movies would never think to incorporate a 40 as a horror movie weapon. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> so only in in Snoop Dogg's. Hit so yeah, it's it's very enjoyable. I think it's definitely worth watching. And like I said, either check it out on Tubi for free, or get the Brown Sugar app if you want to watch it uncut. Mine was a lot more serious and brutal than yours was. It, even though it does it does have a sense of humor to it, it does have a uh, a bit of campiness to it. But I watched Mother's Day from two thousand ten. Mm -hmm. It's uh, directed by a director I'm becoming more and more of a fan of, Darren Lynn Bowsman. He did Saw 2, 3, and 4, which are arguably the best of the franchise besides Part 1. Mm -hmm. He also did Repo, the genetic opera, which tragically I've not seen it yet, but I heard nothing but good things. It's a horror musical. And right, he's also has a nice Blu-ray release of that movie. Oh, cool. And then uh, he's, he just finished the directing Spiral, the book of Saw. So uh, after seeing fire. this, I'm even after seeing this, I'm even more excited about the new song. This one is actually a remake. I I had no idea until after I was done watching it because I remember the first Mother's Day, and this one didn't feel like it at all. So it's based on the 1980 film Mother's Day, which was not as good as this, about two brothers who kidnap and brutalize three women to please their mother. 
So the synopsis of this one is that the three outlaw brothers are in a robbery gone wrong. They retreat to what they think is their mother's house, not knowing that she has lost the house in foreclosure and the new owners are having a party. The brothers terrorize the partiers until their mother arrives and things get even worse and more sadistic and brutal. And uh, it's actually uh, based on a true story and inspired by a true crime in Wichita, Kansas, in which three brothers break into a house and they don't realize that it's been foreclosed on and uh, a new uh, owners have moved in and they're having a party. And it was supposed to, the script was written as a true story about that. But the studio want, got the script and they decided they wanted to do a Mother's Day remake. So they kind of horned in the mother aspect of it. But they're ingenious, ingenious, uh, you know, really bad decision to make it a remake of Mother's Day, but an awesome decision to put Rebecca De Mornay as the mother because uh, I can't imagine it without her. Can I, I would that? like to have seen that true story done by Darren Lynn Bowsman, but she made this movie awesome. That is a head spinning studio decision. Only yeah. a major studio head could see, could look at a, a film that's based on a true and disturbing story and say, hey, let's make this a Mother's Day remake. Yeah. <laughs> that's, proceed. That just sounds the, funny right there. <laughs> the original script was called Wichita. Mm. So I'd, I'd kind of like to see that one, but I, I can't deny I, I enjoyed that they did make it a Mother's Day uh, remake. And of course, the great Rebecca De Mornay is the mom. Uh, she's been in some horror adjacent stuff that was really good. Uh, Hand That Rocks the Cradle and Identity. Uh, she was in uh, one or two really bad, like two point something rated horror films. And then of course that horrible Shining remake. So she's floated around the horror genre, but th this is by far the best thing she's ever done in horror. Jamie King, I've been a big fan of Jamie King for a while. She's she's one of these actresses who have been floating around the Scream Queen title for a while now and hasn't quite solidified it, but I can't. I think she has the chops for it. She did The Tripper, the political slasher directed by David Arquette. She did They Wait, My Bloody Valentine, the re uh, remake, Bad. Silent Night remake, bad. Uh, but I haven't seen Black Summer. She did a TV series called Black Summer a while back, which was supposed to be pretty good. Excellent cast in this one. We got Frank Grillo, another one I'm a huge fan of. Um, I was even a fan of him in The Purge. I thought The Purge 2 was awful. I thought the next Purge was even more awful, but he was the best part of either one of those. And somehow he was a badass in Purge 2 in this horror, surrounded by a horrible movie. That's what one of the reasons why I'm a big fan of him. He really shined in the gray with uh, Liam Neeson. He was also in this excellent movie written and directed by Joe Lynch called Point Blank with Anthony Mackie. Awesome little action film, uh, really gory, so it's also, it's also uh, horror adjacent. Uh, another uh, underrated horror actor who uh, uh, I've been a fan of for a while, Sean Ashmore is in it. He, he's actually probably the best character in this. Uh, he's the toughest, he's the smartest, uh, he's the one you root for the most, probably. Um, he was in The Ruins, a movie I'm a big fan of. Uh, Frozen, Adam Green's Frozen, was just three people on a ski lift. Awesome. Uh, Culture Shock, the uh, uh, Gigi Saul Guerrero movie from on Hulu. And he was also in X-Men and The Boys, but uh, he had superhero roles in those. He's awesome in it. Uh, had Deborah Ann Wool, Deborah Ann Wool, the redhead from True Blood. And also a uh, really good performance from Brianna Evigan. She's another underrated actress. She was in Sorority Row a few years back and also in Burning Bright, a very underrated movie that came released around the same time, around 2010, about uh, her being stalked by a tiger, which was a low budget film, surprisingly effective showing a tiger stalking her. So I uh, highly recommend that. So great cast and an almost two hour film that jumps literally right into it. It's it's packs packs this thing. There's no lulls throughout the film. It, there's not even a lull when you when they're setting up a story at the beginning. So you open with a pretty intense baby kidnapping scene out of a nursery. Very well filmed, very effective. You cut to a robbery and a brutal stabbing. And then uh, you briefly cut between it's it's these brothers. They're in, they're in this robbery and there's a stabbing. So you briefly cut between uh, uh, Jamie King and, and uh, Frank Grillo having this party 
and then you cut between them and the killers are in the car on the way to the house. This was only really derivative part of it. The, one of the brothers is in the back seat, he's injured, and he's screaming. It's very reminiscent of Tim Roth in uh, Reservoir Dogs. I've seen this a few times in movies where uh, a gangster is injured and dying and bloody, and he seems to really want to be Tim Roth in Reservoir Dogs. Oh, the overly screaming, overly writhing around, so that was the only part in this movie that really gave me like, eh, that was a little derivative. But anyway, so they briefly cut between this and the party at the house. And all of a sudden, the killers are in the house. Like five, ten minutes into the movie, the killers are already in the house. And shit, where are they going to go from here? So you got uh, the bad guys are the, the smart but angry brother, uh, the dumbass wild flake brother, and the screaming injured brother. Uh, and then they call the mom, which is Re Re Rebecca de Mornay, de Mornay, and then she brings the mousy redhead daughter. So that's your bad guys. And then your good guys are the young couple, and then a, a, a black couple that's friends of theirs, and then the doctor played by Sean Ashmore, him and his girlfriend. And then uh, uh, a really good twist, I thought, that is really... Um, a great reason to keep these people in this house terrorizing and tormenting these people because the brothers have apparently been sending money to the house the whole time that they've been doing their robberies and they didn't know that the mom was not there so uh somebody in the house took their money and hid it so they're they're constantly through the whole movie tormenting them and staying so that's so there's a good reason why they're staying and doing this and then uh there's a lot of really cool scenes when the, the smart brother takes Jamie King. She takes everybody's ATM. They take everybody's ATM cards and she takes them. Uh, he takes them around. He takes her around to different ATMs. There's some really good scenes in there, really intense. And then uh, uh, the tormenting of the victims that's orchestrated by the mom. You got uh, stuff like th this. This is where it was reminiscent of Saw. You got stuff like them telling one character, you have 30 seconds to kill your friend or I'll kill you both. Stuff like that. And then you got uh, the mom insists <clears throat> that one of the girls have sex with her injured son who's writhing around bloody on the couch. And shes it's really awkward. She's like helping the girl strip. And it's like, ew. Luckily, it doesn't go too far, just enough to make it That's awkward and nuts. <clears throat> so it doesn't go too far, but it's, it's a really intense scene. And then... Uh, they do a thing where Frank Grillo, like one of the girls escapes and Frank Grillo has to go and force her to come back in. So you get these people, it's a really good dynamic where it's friends pitted against friends in situation after situation. So that was really cool. And then uh, during all this, you see a lot of secrets between the victims revealed and that they, they turn, turn against each other, each other, whether prompted for by the, the killers or just coming up on its own. So I thought that was really cool. And then uh, all the brutality in this was awesome. Brutal, intense movie. And Darren Lynn Bowsman knows how to, uh, is one of those directors that knows how to film violence where it looks like it hurts. You got people being shot in the face, shot in the head, shot in the back. You got brutal stabbings. You got uh, friends brutally bashing each other. You got a cue ball head smashing, a toilet lid head smashing cutting board head smashing, a n awesome nail gun kill where they pour uh, uh, s salt in the person's face while they're, while, uh, they're shooting their face full of nails. Mm -hmm. And then an awesome, brutal fight between Rebecca de Mornay and Jamie King at the end. I love an intense and brutal final fight. That's one of the greatest things about an action horror movie. And these two chicks go at it. And damn, it's a brutal fight. I loved it. And then uh, right up to the end, there's an excellent twist at the end, brings the whole thing full circle. Uh, it recalls the opening scene. So just the whole thing, I, I really enjoyed it. Uh, like I said, some of it is slightly derivative of, of Saw and of Reservoir Dogs. But other than that, uh, really intense, brutal, enjoyable, and really tight filmmaking by Darren Lynn Bowsman from beginning to end. Mother's Day from 2010. And it's available on Tubi, of course. But if you don't want to watch it with commercials, it's also available on Prime. 
Well, we hope you enjoyed our Candyman special. Um, we certainly had fun reviewing those movies. Um, we certainly had fun watching them. Doesn't necessarily mean that they're the best of movies, but they are fun <laughs> to watch in their own weird little way. And we both highly recommend that you check out um, both Hood of Horror and Mother's Day, the remake. Snoop Dogg's Hood of Horror, that is. Um, check us out on Facebook and Instagram. On Facebook, it's uh, facebook.com slash Pickles Horror Show. Yep. And Instagram, it's at, um, at Pickles Horror Show. And if you wanted to um, check us out wherever we're available, whether it's our social media or any um, platform we're on, we're available through YouTube, Spotify, SoundCloud, Apple Podcasts. Just visit our flow page, and that will be in our description. Till next week, folks, happy horror. Happy horror.